Well, just to recap a little bit, the boys that finished with the displays put the bikes in place. Ben put the girls' dolls and some extra doll clothing in his display window along, along with the pink bike. He then went and helped Timmy put all the Matchbox cars in the hanging displays. It rotated, and when someone was inside the store, they could go by the rear of the front display and rotate it to see all four sides of the rack. The last thing in was to put the display windows were four small Christmas trees, about four feet tall on each of the front corners of each display. They had motorized bases, and when plugged in, lit up and rotated. Each display left and right had two trees, one in each corner again. Mr. Johnson said the boys went with the boys outside to see how it looked from the outside. Everyone was in agreement that it looked great. Mr. Johnson said that he would add some Christmas bunting on the outside around the front windows, but he would have to get a ladder and would do that later. Chapter 3 After finishing their work, Timmy and Ben, along with Rusty, went next door to choose their free lunch for Mr. Johnson. The ice cream shop was owned by Miss, Mrs. Miller's husband, and she was the church secretary that Timmy and Ben had helped on occasion. Mr. Miller was behind the counter when the boys came into the store. Hello, boys, said Joe Miller. It looks like you two fellas worked up quite an appetite with all that work you did on the displays. I peeked over once in a while and you guys did a fine job. I would say, he added. Well, thanks, Mr. Miller, said Timmy with a big grin. It was great fun and we saw some really nice toys that even we would like to have for Christmas, Timmy added. We sure did, said Ben. Well, the two of you lads come on over here and here are your menus. Mr. Johnson said, you guys can pick anything you would like as it is all on Mr. Johnson, so... Take your time, and I'll be right back, and take your orders. Ben and Timmy sat and looked at the menus, with all different kinds of hot dogs and hamburgers with all the assorted fixings for them to choose from. Miller's was known for their great french fries, and that would be a must for them. Mr. Miller brought over a couple of large milk bone dog biscuits for Timmy to give to Rusty so he would not feel left out. He came back in about 10 minutes to get their orders. The ice cream shop was all decorated in reds and whites with a huge counter area off to the right and the front customers could look through the grass, the glass and see all the various tubs of ice cream to choose from. Across the back wall were alternating six inch wide red and white stripes going up to the ceiling. They were four feet by six feet tall menu boards listing all the types of ice creams with a choice of sugar cones, waffle cones, or just the old style wafer cones. You could even get little tubs of ice cream and sundaes of three sizes with brownies and banana splits and many kinds of shakes and malts. Malts were Timmy and Ben's favorite. The boys both chose cheeseburgers but no lettuce and tomato, and plenty of Heinz ketchup for the burgers and fries. Ben ordered a chocolate mold and Timmy strawberry. Rusty probably would have enjoyed a burger as well, but he was enjoying his dog bones all the same. Miller's was quite full for it being just past 2 p.m. The boys were so busy with their displays, they had lost track of time. That happens when you were enjoying what you were doing. The boys had talked about the train sets they had put up and how much fun it might be if that's what they got for Christmas. They kept trying to decide which kind of track layout they liked best and hoped that they got some extra track so that they could have multiple types of displays, so not to get bored with the layout. They enjoyed daydreaming about it anyway. The boys really enjoyed their burgers and fries and thanked Mr. Miller and also thanked him for thinking of Rusty. They left and went back over and thanked Mr. Johnson again for lunch and the work and then headed home 
through the park, taking their time riding their bikes on a nice afternoon. They finally got home a little after 3 p.m. and parted ways, with Ben heading home so his mom would not worry about him being gone so long. Timmy's mom was on the sofa doing some mending of his socks and had some classical music going on on the stereo, enjoying a quiet afternoon. Timmy told her all about their day and the work at Johnson's and what a great lunch they had at Miller's and how nice it was for Mr. Johnson not only to treat them, but he even paid them $5 apiece for their time. Timmy told his mom all about the train set he and Ben put up in each of their windows, but she had never said she heard anything about it, leaving all the drama and hope of Christmas intact. She did not want to spoil the surprise, as that was a big part of the holiday anyway. Timmy said he was going to lay down on his bed and look at some comic books, but within ten minutes fell fast asleep, and his mom had to wake him up just before 5 p.m. when his father got home. Ben got home and his mother had found some old newspapers up in their attic and thought Ben might like to go through them. One of them had the front page story of the bank robbery in town 10 years ago and that the robbers were caught but the money from the bank was never recovered. It was over $20,000 and the biggest robbery anyone had ever heard of in their town of Hastings Mills. The police were baffled, but no one could figure out where the robbers had hid the money before they were caught, and they weren't talking. After supper, Timmy went over to Ben's house so they could read the story over and over and wondered where the money could be. Ben said to Timmy, Do you think there might be a reward if somebody found that much money, he asked. Probably so, said Timmy. They both tried to guess how much it might be, as the bank's insurance company had to pay out the loss. They would certainly be interested in getting some of it back at least. The boys spent the rest of their evening together trying to think of where that money could be. They had read that the robbers were caught within 30 minutes of the heist, and they could not have gotten far from the bank in the time. They wondered where on the outskirts of town could they have hidden the money with only 30 minutes to spare. Timmy and Ben decided that they were going to try and crack the case and would go down to the police department and see if Chief Bond would give them any additional info that the paper missed. He had been chief over 20 years now and surely would have been part of that investigation. That was their plan for tomorrow. Timmy went home and their plan was to fill their backpacks with notebooks, pencils, flashlights, some water bottles, and a map of the town and would work out filling in their plan after they talked to the chief. Chapter 4 When Ben came over to Timmy's house the next morning early, he and Timmy had brought his set of binoculars as Ben thought they might come in handy. Timmy had asked his mom if he could borrow her larger pair that she used for bird watching in the backyard. And she agreed, but she urged him to take good care of them and certainly not lose them. Mrs. Jones asked the boys what they were up to, and they said they were going down to the police station and talked to Chief Bond about the big bank robbery that happened in town 10 years ago. Ben had said his mom had found an old bunch of newspapers up in their attic, and they found the one that had the front page story about the robbery and how the money was never recovered. Timmy's mom had all forgotten about the robbery as it was a long time ago, but she knew the robbers were locked up for a long time, but she told the boys to be careful. Ben and Timmy headed down to the police station on their bikes and rode slowly so Rusty could come along. Sometimes they would just walk their bikes on the sidewalk to give Rusty a break from running. It was only about a two-mile ride and walk to the station, and the boys went inside with Rusty. 
The desk sergeant saw the boys come in and came out from behind his big tall desk to greet them, and he gave Rusty a nice warm welcome with a pat on the head. He loved dogs. So is it possible for us to see Chief Bond, asked Timmy. We have some questions we would like to ask him about the bank robbery over ten years ago, he added. Oh, the big bank robbery, chimed in Sergeant Moss. I had only been on the force about six months when that happened, he added. That was the most excitement this department had ever experienced, ever, he added. I'll see if the chief has time to talk to you about it, you all being a couple of fine detectives at all, he said with a big smile. With that, Sergeant Moss went into the chief's office, knocked down the door before he went in, and the boys heard them talking, but could not make out what was being said. Sergeant Moss came back out. Boys, he said, the captain would be glad to see you. Follow me. With that, they all headed back to the chief's office. Rusty followed as well. Chief, this is, uh, boys, I never did ask your names, did I? Stated Moss. That was rude of me. Well, I'm Timmy Jones, and this is Ben Morgan, said Timmy, as the chief came out from behind his desk, and reached down and shook their hands, and gave Rusty a warm pat on the head. He pointed out, he pulled out a milkbone biscuit from his desk, and asked Timmy if it was okay if Rusty had it. Timmy said it was. Rusty went over by the corner and laid down and enjoyed his treat. Boys, have a seat, instructed Captain Bond. So what is it you want to know about the big bank robbery? That was sure a long time ago, inquired Bond, probably before you guys were born. Yes, sir, ten years ago, chimed in Ben. My mom had some old newspapers, and she let me have them, and we read all about it, and how the money, over $20,000, was never recovered at all. That is quite true, said the chief. We never could get the three robbers and the driver, the Allen brothers, to spill the beans about where they did the money. <laughs> they said that their cousin, John Allen, drove the getaway car, but they never told them where they hid it. But he was caught three days later out at the family farm on Beaumont. He acted like he knew nothing of the robbery, but his relatives ratted him out as the driver, and he was arrested and tried with the others. We searched the house, all their vehicles, the barn. We even looked all over their five acres of land to see if they had buried it somewhere on the farm. No luck finding it, though, the chief concluded. So you just kind of gave up, said Timmy, with a question mark? Well... No one really came forward in the family that might have known about it. No, the chief said it's still a mystery to this day. The family still lives out there on the farm, so my guess is the money is still close by, and they have not made any big purchases like new cars or anything, so if they hadn't hit it and knew where it was, they might have bought something, but no one's talking. Well, that is some story, said Timmy. That is a lot of money to go missing from the bank. Yes, it is, but I don't know if anyone will find it, said the chief. No clues have turned up in all this time, and many folks have just forgotten about it. So, what are you boys up to, asked the chief. Well, said Ben, we thought we might do some investigating and see what we might find. Kind of like a needle in a haystack sort of thing, he added. Well, I'll be, said the chief. A couple of junior detectives, are you? Well, not really, said Timmy, but we do like an adventure, he added. Well, said Bond, we can't have private citizens out doing our job, so I guess I should have to make you deputies, just so everything is on the up and up. He reached into his desk drawer and pulled out a couple of police badges and pinned them on the boy's shirts. He, he pulled a third one out and attached it to Detective's rusty collar so it would be all official. How's that, boy? said Captain Bond. Wow, said Timmy and Ben. This is great and very nice of you. Oh, and one other thing he added. 
Here's a real walkie-talkie like we use here in the department. And when you push the talk, you will come right into our comm center, just like all of the other officers here. I will alert them to you two being new deputies and to be ready to pass your calls directly on to me, Bond added. Here is a charger and you'll need to recharge the batteries every night if you use it a lot. Just plug it into the wall and the cord into the socket. The boys agreed to take care of it and thank Chief Bond very much for his help. They really liked the being deputies as well. Chief Bond told them to be careful and not to get into any trouble. He made them promise to stay away from the Allen place and not let them on to what they were doing or working on. They agreed and headed out on their bikes. Timmy, Ben, and Rusty headed home riding very slowly, thinking and talking out loud about what they should do next. Ben thought they should take a look at the map and do some planning at his house. By looking at the bank location, the road patterns out to the Allen place, and other possible places along the way where they may have hidden the money where they might think to look. As they were nearly home, a call came in on the radio. This is Chief Bond. Please come in, boys. Ben took the walkie-talkie and pressed the push-to-talk button and said, This is Ben. Come in, Chief. He waited for a reply. Ben, this is Chief Bond. I meant to tell you that the Allen boys will be getting out of prison in two months, so you better get on to finding that money before they do. Understand? Over? Yes, sir, Chief, said Ben. We're on it, and we will work hard to find it first, he added, smiling at Timmy. Okay, boys, said Chief Bond. Be careful, and out. The boys knew they had their work cut out for them, and got home and pulled out the map, and began to put their plan together. They had to find that money before the Allens got out of prison in two months. They had a lot of work to do.